any of it. We're under the grace of God and Jesus Christ, walking in the Spirit since we live in the Spirit, yielding to the Spirit of God that we might produce the fruit of the Spirit that are not the fruit, which is not the fruit of the flesh. The Christian life is about yielding. It's not about doing. As we yield, then we do. But we cannot do unless we yield. God gives us the desires to do what he tells us to do. We yield to his spirit, and thereby we have the power to do what he tells us to do. That's the Christian life. That's the biblical life of the man of God. And now with this kind of power working through you, and you're unaware of it, it's just working through you. It's the Spirit of God. You now will be able to stand against the satanic power working through the devil's Pope of Rome, his Jesuit order, and his hundreds of secret societies, which presently rule the governments of all nations. To my knowledge, there is not one government on the face of the earth that is not ruled by one of these brotherhoods or a combination of these brotherhoods, all of them subject to the black pope as he himself. His whole purpose is to make the white pope the universal monarch of the world. And that's World Government 101 as taught in my book, Vatican Assassins, which you can get on my website, 247worldradio.com or vaticanassassins.org. Just go there, purchase my ebook. You can even download it for like 25 bucks. 1,836 pages and what, five or six separate downloads. So now let's read a little bit. I had a guy call me yesterday. He said, you know what? Maybe the Jesuits are really the Canaanites. I said, well, they obviously have the Canaanite religion of work salvation because they're bringing the fruit of the ground and they want nothing to do with the blood of the lamb, which Abel brought and he was accepted by God. But it has nothing to do with a racial line of Cain. That is heresy because the Canaanites were all destroyed in the flood. And idolatry, mystery, Babylon, idolatrous religion was started after the flood by Nimrod, which is present-day Romanism, now directed and controlled by the Black Pope, the Grand Druid of the world, and the most powerful Knights Templar of the world. He's the Templar, he's the Druid, he's the Communist, he's the High Freemason. All occult power vests in the Black Pope. And as he directs his obsidian order, the Jesuit order, for the purpose of restoring all nations to the temporal power of the Pope, they obey absolutely and without objection because they're soldiers under command. And soldiers obey the commands of their superiors without question unless those commands are immoral. And wicked, like the command to kill one of your own fellow soldiers. And they're right, Jesuits. And they're right that your CIA has certain soldiers in the American military that kill American officers, just as they did in Nam. Isn't that right, Jesuits? And I know of one of them who killed over 40 American officers during the Vietnam War in battle, on orders from the Pope CIA. Oh, but we can't talk about that, can we? That's classified information. No, it's not. Everybody ought to know. And especially all you guys in the military, how they're using you, used us as suckers for the purposes of the Pope of Rome. And it ought to offend you, and it ought to bring you to the place of righteous indignation enough then to do something about it. Like support this broadcast. I'll be quoting a few quotations now from my book, Vatican Assassins, in chapter 13. And I want you to see how diabolical the Jesuit order really is. This is its history. It took me 20 years to write it. It took me three years to organize it. 
with my finally now my uh, what my fourth edition of 2007. We read on page one, 318, quote, And what became of the country, that means England, after his, Oliver Cromwell's death? Remember, Oliver Cromwell was the greatest man of the last 500 years, without question. The greatest military commander, the greatest statesman, the greatest nationalist, and the greatest Christian that I can see, all combined into one for the last 500 years. The production of this man being a result of the Protestant Reformation, great awakenings in England. Hard preaching to the English people produced men like Oliver Cromwell and the Puritans, which followed him and with their swords hewed their way to political liberty in ending the Jesuit control of that Great Britain ruled by King Charles I, that wicked sinner. What became of the memory of the country after Oliver Cromwell's death? The Stuarts returned. The Stuarts returned, those fanatical Roman Catholic Stuarts, controlled by the Jesuits. And when the rejoicings were over, then punishments followed. One hundred corpses were exhumed. That means dug up. Among which were the great Oliver. His old and venerable mother. I'm going to dig up his mother too. His dearly beloved daughter, Bridget Pym. The wife of Puritan Independent Baptist John Pym. Who twice had his ears cropped off by Charles I. And the famous Admiral Blake. Cromwell had a great admiral named Admiral Blake, and he was a Baptist. Admiral Blake was responsible for the seizure of all the, of all the silver of some of the Spanish uh, galleons there when he brought 38 wagon loads of silver off his ships after they had seized it from the Spanish who stole it from the Indians of South America, and he brought it up to Cromwell and he was be able to finance the Republic. The Commonwealth. We're going to dig up Blake too. The moldering bodies were hung on the tr three corners of the gallows at Tyburn. They took Oliver Cromwell's head. They cut it off. And they put it on a spire in Westminster Abbey. And it was there for 20 years. That's what the Jesuits did to the corpse of Cromwell. That's why the Jesuits dug up the corpse of Lee Harvey Oswald, cut off his head, put another head on the corpse. And it's later discovered after the corpse is exhumed and they find, the coroner finds that, hey, it's not the head that I did the autopsy on because there's no opening of the skull cap. It's a different head. And you can see this in a video series called The Men Who Killed Kennedy. Ears were cut off of these moldering bodies. Noses were slit. And numbers lost their heads on the scaffold. So now we're going to start rounding up all the Puritans, all the significant followers of Cromwell that drove my father, Charles I, to the scaffold and that drove me out of England. Where I had to be protected by the Jesuits in France. So Charles II comes back. My Bonnie lies over the ocean. Bonnie Prince Charles later on, after uh, King Charles II. It's, it's all about the worship of the Stuarts and how wonderful Great Britain was under the Stuarts and how terrible it was under Cromwell. And oh, 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 oh. Cromwell was the greatest thing that ever happened to Great Britain. Ever. Greater than King James, greater than Elizabeth. And she was second to Cromwell. She was truly great, but couldn't match Cromwell. The sentence pronounced against them all, 29 of the signatories on the death warrant of Charles I, was conceived in the following terms. So here's how Charles I is going to kill 29 of his father's enemies. Quote, you shall be drowned, you shall be drawn on a hurdle to the place of execution, and there you shall be hanged by the neck. And being alive, you shall be cut down and mutilated. Your entrails shall be taken out of your body, and you living, the same to be burnt before your eyes, and your head to be cut off, and your body to be divided into four quarters. 
And I add, which Jesuit authored barbaric punishment is nearly identical for those Freemasons who would dare to violate their oaths in telling the secrets of the craft. And so this is how Charles I treated his Puritan enemies. Doesn't sound like he's very tolerant. Oh, no. Charles I is not very tolerant. Charles II is not tolerant. Sounds like he's intolerant. Oh. And a Roman Catholic. Why, Roman Catholics aren't intolerant. It's the Roman Catholics that are always persecuted by those vicious, horrible, terrible Protestants and Baptists. That's the way it really is. Black is white and white is black. I'll never tell you the truth. Those bloodthirsty Roman Catholics doing this to my white Protestant Puritan brethren in the past, and I can't know about it. I can't be taught it in school, and I definitely am not going to be taught about it in church because that would be controversial, wouldn't it? Oh, and we would lose our 501c3 tax exemption status if we taught anything like that, wouldn't we? You coward preachers. Shame on you. And you're going to account for this at the judgment seat of Christ by not teaching your people, the truth about our past. It goes on, the Stuarts, as if this were not enough, filled the country with immorality. I add, including the plays of the Jesuit theater, which present-day counterpart is the Black Pope's Hollywood Theater, which glorifies a fornication, theft, murder, and sorcery. All the movies that you can see generally are going to glorify one of those four things. Two thousand Protestant and Baptist ministers were driven from their benefices, driven from their churches. That sounds like communism to me, because the Jesuits modeled communism after the Stuart and Inquisitional persecutions. That's why the Jesuits are the masters of communism. And you Russian people better wake up and realize the Jesuits have been running your country since, since really, really no later than 1917 with the October Revolution. And really no later than with about 1880s with Alexander III that caused all the Jewish pogroms and Nicholas II that caused the pogroms. They were all controlled by the Jesuits. So they could bring the wrath of God upon you, dear Russian people. Which happened with the Bolshevik Revolution and put you people under communism till 1990 or so. And still you're under Jesuit oppression as enforced and made effective by London and Washington, D.C. Through the military governments running those countries, running those empires. Can't tell you that either in our churches. That would be that would be controversial. <laughs> and the women wouldn't want to come back, would they? And they'll tell their husbands, if you want to go to that church, then I'm not going. Okay. So much for submission today amongst American white Christian women is highly rare. And if they are submitted, it's because their husband has put them there. And they obeyed him. Under the threat that if you do not obey me, I will turn you over to the Lord for chastisement. Is that what you want? Because this whole culture teaches feminism and revolt from your husband. They filled the country with immorality. 2,000 ministers are driven from the churches. The churches were oppressed. Uh, Brother Jack, uh, he has the Polish broadcast on the radio station. He sent me a letter saying, Eric, he said there was a large Lutheran church in one of our Polish cities that was taken over in 1945 after World War II, taken over by the Jesuits, and it's right there on the church. This church used to be a Lutheran church, but now is controlled by the Jesuit order since 1945. You see what the World War II did? It totally destroyed any Protestant influence out of Poland. Because the Jesuits can't have that now. We got to destroy it out of Poland just like we did in the 30 Years War where we killed all the Protestants out or drove them out. And we'll make Poland a Roman Catholic nation if it kills us. And that's what they've done. The noblest hearts of the country were forced to seek a refuge in distant lands. Vast colonies in America were peopled by them. And England would have become like Spain and worse than Spain had not William III resumed the task so energetically begun by Cromwell, unquote. Who said this? Dr. Merle D'Aubigny, 1847, who was a Swiss Protestant theologian, historian, 
and he wrote his book, The Protector of Vindication. You may get this book from Sprinkle Publications. So God raised up William III to stop the vicious persecutions of Charles II and James II when he, by the grace of God, won at the Battle of the Boyne in 1690 and restored Protestantism and that it would not be persecuted by the papists. And shortly thereafter, a law was passed that no Roman Catholic could sit on the throne of England, and that law is still in place. Too bad Elizabeth II is a secret Roman Catholic. Isn't that right, Elizabeth? You prostitute for the Pope. Don't tell me she's virtuous. If she was, she would stop the destruction of the Protestant English people. She would stop the alien Muslim and African invasion into England and Great Britain. She would kick out the, the Jesuits and she would kick out the Archbishop of Westminster. And she would start acting like a Protestant. But she's not. She's a prostitute Protestant. She's a dame of Malta. She's a Bilderberger. What's wrong with you? Why do you say she's a Protestant? She's a traitor. I say things like this in my broadcast and it really makes me popular. Especially in the eyes of certain brethren. Well, let's go on about another quotation here. Let's go to page 320. We read, Bode Johann Joachim Christoph. This concerns Freemasonry. Born in Brunswick, 18th of January, 1730, one of the most distinguished Masons of his time. In 1757, he established himself at Hamburg as a bookseller and was initiated in the Masonic order. To Masonic literature, he made many valuable contributions. Among others, he translated from the French Nicolas de Bonneville's celebrated work entitled Les Jesuits Chasses de la Maconnerie et le Poignard Bris par les Macons, which contains a comparison of Scottish Masonry with the Templarism of the 14th century. In 1790, he joined, the, by the way, de, bon, de Bonneville was a Jesuit. In 1790, he joined the Order of the Illuminati, obtaining the highest degree in a se second class. <clears throat> and at the Congress of Wilhelmsbad in 1782, he had advocated the opinions of Weishaupt. No man of his day was better versed than he in the history of Freemasonry or possessed a more valuable and extensive library. No one was more diligent in increasing his stock of Masonic knowledge or more anxious to avail himself of the rarest sources of learning. This is Bode, B-O-D-E, Johann Joachim Christoph. Hence, he has always held an exalted position among the Masonic scholars of Germany. The theory which he had conceived on the origin of Freemasonry, a theory, and I had carefully declared to be untenable, quote-unquote, by Masonic coadjutor Mackey, who Mackey also wrote the Encyclopedia Freemasonry, was that the order was invented by the Jesuits. Here's this top Freemason in Europe, in Germany, who states the Scottish Rite Freemasonry was invented by the Jesuits. You got that, David Icke? Don't talk to me about Scottish Rite Freemasonry being the largest Masonic body in the world without telling me that the Jesuits created it from the fourth degree to the 33rd degree. But you see, you can't talk about this in, in, Patri in, uh, in alternative method, in alternative news circles. You can't talk about this in the, in, in the conspiratorial press now. You can't say these kinds of things. You can't blame the Jesuits for it. Oh, no, because we got to keep this, this uh, ripoff continuing so that people never know who really is controlling the world. Isn't that right, Alex Jones? Hmm? With your father, Edmund father-in-law, Edmund Lowe Nichols, being a knight of Malta. Isn't that right, Alex? You don't say my name on your broadcast, but I'll say yours on mine. How about that? You too, Tex Mars.
was that the order was invented by the Jesuits in the 17th century as an instrument for the reestablishment of the Roman Church in England, covering it for their own purposes under the mantle of Templarism. That's right. And they would do the same thing here because a Freemason, a 32nd degree Freemason by the name of Franklin Delano Roosevelt, an Episcopalian Protestant would be used by the Jesuits to impose militaristic military government on March 9th, 1933 in this country, aided by the Knights of Columbus and the Jesuits and the Bonesmen. Because that was the purpose of Scottish Rite Freemasonry anyway, to restore the supremacy of the Church of Rome in historic white Protestant nations, as was done in England, Great Britain, so it was done here. You like being under military government, white men? You like being under Masonic rule, Scottish Rite rule, controlled by the Jesuits? You like that? Well, then just continue to live under it, but I'm not. I need another country. And that's what I'm praying for, for me and my people. Here's another quotation. Quote, the Jesuits were driven to cooperate with the other two international brotherhoods, the Freemasons and the Jews, specifically Rothschild and Illuminati, in the destruction of the Spanish Empire, unquote. Who said this? Salvador de Madera de Aga. Madariaga, Salvador de, de Madariaga, 1820. He's a Spanish statement, statesman in his book, The Jesuits. So the Jesuits and the Masons and the Masonic Jews all working together, overseen by the Jesuits for the destruction of the Spanish Empire in the 1800s. And why not? Because the King of Spain had expelled the Jesuits in 1767. So we're going to make him pay. We're going to make that Roman Catholic disobedient son pay for expelling us Jesuits out of his empire and out of South America. Yep. Here's another quote. Same page, 320. Out of my book, Vatican Assassins. Quote, There are still old ladies, male and female, about the country who will tell you with grim gravity that if you trace up masonry through all its orders till you come to the grand tip-top head mason of the world, you will discover that the, that the dread individual and the chief of the Society of Jesus are one and the same person. Who said this? James Parton, 1855, American historian. In the life of Horace Greeley, I remember the day I found this quote. In Franklin and Marshall Library, up on the third floor, and when I found it, I nearly fell over and fainted. You see, these people have known this for, for years, for over a century. But we were never told. You cannot know this. You cannot know the Masonic Lodge, the Scottish Rite, and York Rite, for that matter, are nothing but agents at the top for the Jesuit order to restore Romanism and the rule of the Jesuits and the supremacy of Romanism in this country. You can't know that. And if you Masons don't believe it, you're in denial and you're deceiving yourselves. And so all the power that you have, your economic power, being heads of certain big banks and being in academia and being the head in political matters throughout the country, you are willingly ignorant of the fact that you're being used to restore and to maintain now the supremacy of the Roman Brotherhood, the Roman hierarchy in this country as overseen and directed by the Jesuit provincials in this country and the Jesuit assistant in Rome. So this is fair warning to you. You know now who runs Scottish Rite Freemasonry, and you have an obligation before God to get out and to tell the truth. What have you to lose? Page 321. We're going to read from a classic work here. I maintain the greatest work ever written on Freemasonry. Quote, Hence, according to Pope Leo XII, after whom the present Pope is named, Leo XIII, 
The very Bible which is insulted on the Masonic altar contains not the revelation of God, but simply the, quote, gospel of the devil, unquote. That's according to Pope Leo XII. According to the Pope, the Reformation Bible contains the gospel of the devil. And you Protestants and Baptists want to tell me that the Roman Catholic Church is Christian? One of the great mistakes of C.I. Schofield, who said the Church of Thyatira is the Roman Catholic Church. <coughs> God, deliver me. Thyatira is the Orthodox Church out of Byzantium. No. The Bible contains the gospel of the devil. While Freemasonry steps boldly to the front, exclaiming, Quite correct, Most Holy Father, quite correct. My square and compass are every way equal to, if not superior to, the authorized version of the Bible, and will, quote, enlighten, unquote, mankind as well. Go on, my dear sir, go on, Brother Leo, and issue your bulls and encyclicals against the Bible with all the rancor of which your old heart is capable, and I'll keep right on in my peculiarly aggressive course, degrading and debasing God's word below my pagan emblems and teaching my people that it is no better than the Quran, the Shasters, or the Book of Mormon. Go on, Mr. Pope, make all the Roman Catholics you can, and I'll guarantee to manufacture quite as many infidels from among the Protestants, and I will add the Baptists, too. You know, there's 500,000 Masons in the Southern Baptist Convention, you know that? And between us, I think, we shall be able to neutralize the great work of the Reformation and perhaps destroy biblical, Bible-based Christianity altogether, unquote. Edmund Ronane, 1879, American ex-Romanist and converted Freemason, the master's carpet or masonry and Baal worship, identical. We'll be back. Continue our reading. This is 24-7 World Radio. This is Brother Jack. I invite you to listen to my broadcast on 247worldradio.com. I preach the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ to the Polish-speaking people scattered around the whole world. Furthermore, I defend the Reformation in Poland, Polish Protestants and Baptists, and Polish Reformation Bible. I also expose the Counter-Reformation in my homeland, led by the Jesuits and by the Roman Catholic Institution. Join me every Thursday at 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time or on 247worldradio.com. Tu Brat Jacek, zapraszam Was do wysłuchania mojej audycji na 247 worldradiocom Głoszę Ewangelię Pana Jezusa Chrystusa ludziom mówiącym po polsku rozproszonym po całym świecie. Ponadto bronię reformacji w Polsce, polskich protestantów i baptystów oraz polskiej Biblii reformacyjnej. Demaskuję również kontreformację w mojej ojczyźnie kierowaną przez jezuitów i przez rzymskokatolicką instytucję. Dołącz do mnie w każdy czwartek o godzinie 17 czasu wschodnioamerykańskiego na 247worldradio.com. This is Brother Nicholas. Join me every Tuesday at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for the German Bible Truth Hour and at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for the Dutch Bible Truth Hour on 24-7 World Radio. This is Bruder Nicholas. Ich lade euch herzlich ein, mich anzuhören, jeder Dienstag am 2 Uhr nachmittags, amerikanische Zeit, für die deutsche Bibelwahrheitsstunde und 3 Uhr amerikanische Standardzeit für die niederländische Bibelwahrheitsstunde am World Radio 24-7. Dit is Bruder Nico. Ich bin hartelijk uitgenodigd om elke Dinsdag om 2 Uhr amerikanische Standardzeit het Duitse Bijbelwaarheidsuur te volgen en drie uur Amerikaanse standaardtijd het Nederlandse Bijbelwaarheidsuur te volgen op 24-7 World Radio. You're listening to 24-7 World Radio. Welcome back, back with the broadcast. Continuing on our Quotations, further exposing the Jesuits. 
We read from Alexander Hislop's tremendous work, The Two Babylons. Quote, this is page 322 of my book, Vatican Assassins. Quote, there has never been any difficulty in the mind of any enlightened Protestant in identifying the woman, quote, sitting on seven mountains, unquote, and having on her forehead the name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, with the Roman apostasy. No other city in the world has ever been celebrated as the city of Rome has for its situation on seven hills. Pagan poets and orators who had no thought of elucid elucidating prophecy have alike characterized it as the seven-hilled city, quote-unquote. It has been known all along that popery was baptized paganism. I shall repeat that. It has been known all along that popery was baptized paganism. That's why a Roman Catholic is not a Christian. That the paganism which Rome has baptized is, in all its essential elements, the very paganism which prevailed in the ancient literal Babylon. Rome is in very deed the Babylon of the Apocalypse. Her priesthood and her orders, namely the Jesuits, have all been derived from ancient Babylon. And finally, that the Pope himself is truly and properly the lineal representative of Belshazzar. The Babylonians in their popular religion supremely worshipped a goddess mother and a son who was represented in pictures and in images as an infant or child in his mother's arms. From Babylon, this worship of the mother and the child spread to the ends of the earth. Now this Ninus, or son, born in the arms of the Babylonian Madonna, is so described as very clearly to identify him with Nimrod. Now Nimrod, he is the son of Cush, was black, in other words, was a Negro. Wherever the Negro aspect of Nimrod was found an obstacle to his worship, all that was needful was just to teach that Ninus, Osiris, had reappeared in the person of a posthumous son, Horus, of a fair complexion, supernaturally born by his widowed wife, Isis, after the father had gone to glory, unquote. And so, <clears throat> the Jesuits are the masters of the Babylonian mystery in which they want to bring the slain Nimrod back to life, as the reincarnated son, Tammuz. In Egypt, the slain Osiris to bring back as the reincarnated Horus. And that mystery will actually be worked out one day in the future when that seventh Roman Caesar, the final Pope of Rome, is slain and he rises from the dead to be the risen king of Babylon. The risen set, or some name like that, fulfilling this Babylonian prophecy of the, of the Babylonian Messiah, yet to come. The Jesuits are the masterminds and the great promoters and pushers. They are the impetus behind this satanic plot and mystery of iniquity to bring the final probe of Rome to world power after he's slain and rises from the dead. The Jesuits are all about this. Of course, thank God the church is not going to be here for that. We go on a little bit farther and we read Martin Wagner, Martin L. Wagner, 1912, American Lutheran minister. Freemasonry and interpretation. See, here's when the Lutherans were not apostate yet. When they still preached from the Luther Bible. Page 224, quote, In countries where there is an established religion, adherence to it is a necessit necessary qualification for office. A citizen's religion determines largely his eligibility to a place of public trust. In this country... And I add the Black Pope's Holy Roman 14th Amendment American Empire. While we have no legally established religion, and I add thanks to the Baptist Calvinist First Amendment, we do have what in effect amounts to substantially the same thing. Masonry has become so powerful, so thoroughly organized, 
so thoroughly insinuated into the political life of our country that adherence to it has become practically a prereq prerequisite to appoint or election to office. He goes on. If it does not in every case dictate the nomination of the candidates, it does succeed in bringing them into its fold after their election, thus making them adherents of the state religion. You know who's a Freemason quietly about this? Ron Paul. Yeah. Do you think he really wants to restore the Republic when he doesn't tell you of the power of Freemasonry, the power of the Jesuits, the power of the Roman hierarchy in this country, who really runs the Federal Reserve Bank? Do you think he really wants to restore any kind of limited government when he doesn't tell you that we've been under military government since March 9th, 1933? Do you think he really wants to restore anything? Or are we white men that stupid and that gullible? He goes on and states, there are over 1 million Masons in the United States. This is 1912. There's many more than that now. All voters and those are a powerful factor in influencing those in office. Being a secret organization and governed by principles which are designed to exalt the order and its members, there is practically nothing to frustrate their designs. There's only one thing that can frustrate their designs, and that's the man of God walking in the power of God, yielding to the Spirit of God, and openly rebuking and denouncing this national sin of this secret brotherhood working for the Jesuit order. That's the only thing that breaks up their power. The Spirit of God as preached by the, the, the Spirit of God, the, and the man of God by the power of the Spirit of God preaching the Word of God and denouncing sin publicly. Remember, Cromwell said every preacher is a public man. We got to be public. There's nothing private about what we do. It's very public what we say and what we believe. Because it's part of our good works to renounce the hidden things of darkness, to have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather to reprove them, bring them to light. That's what we do. That's why we talk about Freemasonry on these broadcasts, working for the Pope, with the prayer and desire that there will be certain Freemasons that will leave the order, confess their sin, and start to do the Lord's will and promote the mystery of godliness in getting the gospel out while living a righteous life and exposing the power of Rome. That's true, Bible-believing Christianity. You say, well, Rome's going to kill me if I do that. God's going to kill you if you don't. Why do you think he allowed the Muslims to rise up and kill 750,000 Assyrian Christians because they became apostate? Why do you think he allowed Islam to destroy the Orthodox Christians of Constantinople in 1453 because they became apostate? They started worshiping the Virgin Mother. Why do you think God allowed the destruction of the Orthodox Church in Russia because they became apostate and began, began persecuting the Jews? So the Lord brought Stalin into Russia and persecuted the Orthodox people for their apostasy, killing over 5,000 priests and nuns. And you know what? He's going to do the same thing here because the Protestants and the Baptists in this country refuse to expose the power of Rome, the Jesuit order, and what they intend to do here. Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For what's for man soweth, that shall he also reap. And we're going to reap nationally in this country because of an apostate, Laodicean, God-forsaken church in this country that the Lord has spewed out of his mouth and going to give it over to men like uh, to burn with fire as in John 15, when you are the, I am the, you are the branches, I am the vine. If you don't bear fruit, you're cut forth, you're cast forth, and men take you and burn you. And that's what's going to happen here. We're going to be burned up. We're going to be taken off to concentration camps, killed and probably incinerated. And remember, the first people that went to Auschwitz weren't Jews. The first people that went to Auschwitz were, were Protestant Czechs. We're not told that, are we? A little bit farther. Masonry has been made the religion of the state. We doubt whether any ecclesiastical power 
controls more completely the government of any country through the established church than does masonry, the federal, state, and municipal governments of our land. This is 1912 now. Masonry, and I add secretly modeled after the devil's Egyptian, Isis, Horus, Seb, Luciferian, mystery, Babylon religion, and directed by the black pope, is to all intents and purposes, and in its practical effects, the state religion in our country. The state religion in our country. It is the covenant that makes the Mason, quote unquote. And that, like the Jesuit having taken his perpetual vows, no law of the land can affect that covenant. No anathema of the church can weaken it. Once a Mason, always a Mason. Even the power of Jesus Christ, King of kings and Lord of lords, cannot, according to Masonic teaching, break that covenant or absolve the Mason from it. Quoting a Masonic authority, Martin L. Wagner, quoting that Masonic authority in his work, Freemasonry and Interpretation. You see how Masonry is subversive of political liberty? Not only Romanism and the Roman hierarchy and the Jesuit order and the Knights of Columbus and the Skull and Bones, but Freemasonry is subversive of political liberty. Why? Because it's run by the Jesuit general. Remember what Bode said? He said that the Jesuit general authored Scottish Rite and it was patterned after the Templars. Continuing on, page 325, page 325 of my book, I'm quoting another individual, quote, there is considerable analogy between Masonic and Jesuitic degrees, and the Jesuits also tread down the shoe and bear the knee because Ignatius Loyola thus presented himself at Rome and asked for the confirmation of the order. He tread down the shoe and bare the knee. Loyola did that. You know why? Because Loyola was a Spanish Templar. Uniting the suppressed Knights Templars for the founding of the new Templars called the Knights of the Virgin Mary or renamed the Society of Jesus. That runs this country with 28 major Jesuit universities in this country running all the banks. And there's a Jesuit university in nearly every city in which there's a Federal Reserve Bank. Yep. Who, wrote, who said this? Charles William Heckethorn, 1875. He's an English historian in his work, Secret Societies of All Ages and Countries. We read another quote here. Nicholas de Bonneville. A historian in literature, born in Epherix in France, March 13, 1760. He was the author of a work published in 1788 titled The Jesuits, divided into two parts of the first, which was the subtitle was, and gives that. His Masonic theory was that the Jesuits had introduced into the symbolic degrees the history of the life and death of the Templars and the doctrine of vengeance for, their, for the political and religious crime of their destruction, and that they had imposed upon four of the higher degrees the four vows of their congregation, the Society of Jesus. Who said this? Albert G. Mackey, 33rd degree, 1917, American Masonic Historian and Encyclopedia of Freemasonry. Now here's an excellent quote. We read, Quote, the higher I went into the Jesuit order, the more corruption I saw within the institution. I was invited to attend a secret black mass by high-ranking Jesuits, including Superior General Pedro Rupe, in a monastery in the northern part of Spain. When I knelt to kiss the ring of the high official, I saw a symbol on that ring that made my blood run cold. It was a Masonic symbol, the compass in the square. A thing I hated, and I had been told to fight against it. I found out the Jesuit general was also a Mason and a member of the Communist Party in Spain. The Black Pope controlling communism and papal fascism. Who wrote this? Alberto Rivera, 1979, Spanish-American ex-Jesuit in his work published by Chick Publications titled Alberto. And he was a Jesuit. And his testimony was true. Jesuit general's a mason. Going on farther. 
We read. We read. We read uh, concerning Himmler. Page 332. Quote, Himmler set up a museum dedicated to Masonic uniforms and regalia. His chief work was the establishment of Wevelsburg. Establishment at Wevelsburg of a castle which reflected the reading he had done on King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table. The leaders of the SS, a secret chapter of the order of the SS according to SSST General Walter Schellenberg, were entitled to assemble once a year at a large oak table in a dining room measuring 100 feet by 145 feet. They sat on high back chairs made out of pigskin, on each of which was a silver disc on which the selected knight, quote-unquote, had his name engraved. Here the chiefs of the SS, Obergruppenführers Karl Wolf, Gottlieb Berger, Hans Jettner, Richard Hildebrandt, Franz Beikrupt, Maximilian von Herf, Kurt Dallage, Jutra Greifeth, Werner Lorenz, August Heismeyer, Oswald Pohl, and Reinhard Hedrick, later replaced by Ernest Kaltenbrunner, were compelled to sit in the company of their Grand Master for hours of contemplation. And what were they contemplating? Why, Jesuit Loyola's spiritual exercises. Who wrote this? G.S. Grabber, 1978, American historian in his The History of the SS. Going on a little farther. We read of the Masonic induction of a brother in Christ in 1980s. Quote, I flew into Washington National Airport and took a taxi to the house of the temple on Northwest 16th Street. Upon arriving at the temple in Washington, D.C., I was met by a receptionist who asked if I were there to receive the 33rd degree. I was surprised to, surprised to find a woman in those sacred Masonic precincts, but said that I was and showed her my letter from the Supreme Council. We were called into one of the offices one at a time and interviewed by three members of the Supreme Council. When my turn came, I was ushered into the office and seated. The very first question I was asked was, of what religion are you? Not long before this, I would have answered with something like, I believe in the ancient mysteries, the old religion, and I believe in reincarnation. Kind of like Darth Vader. Darth Vader believes in the old religion. However, without thinking at all about how to answer, I find myself saying, I am a Christian. Then to my surprise and theirs, I asked of them, are you men born again? The man in charge quickly stopped me by saying, we're not here to talk about that. We are here to ask you questions. After they sent me back out, I sat down and thought about it. When the next man came out, I asked him, did they ask you if you were a Christian? He said, yes, they did. What did you tell them? I asked, and he, and he replied, I told them, hell no, and I never intend to be. Then he said a strange thing to me. They said, I am going higher. And he left through a different door, looking pleased. The representative candidate was dressed in black trousers, barefooted, bareheaded, and draped in a long black robe that reminded me of a very long black raincoat. He had a black cable toe around his neck, that's a noose, okay, but was not hoodwinked. When it was time for the final obligation, we all stood and repeated the oath with the representative candidate administered by the Sovereign Grand Inspector General. We then swore true allegiance to the Supreme Council of the 33rd degree above all other allegiances, and I add, including the U.S. Constitution. One of the conductors then handed the candidate a human skull upside down with wine in it. With all of his candidates repeating after him, he sealed the oath, Quote, may this wine I now drink become a deadly poison to me, as the hemlock juice drunk by Socrates, should I ever knowingly or willfully violate the same. 
unquote, namely the oath. You know, Skull and Bones does the same thing. He then drank the wine, and I add, as did Canadian Prime Minister Paul Martin and Americans George W. Bush and John Kerry when they both were initiated into Yale Skull and Bones Society. The Sovereign Grand Commander closed the meeting of the Supreme Council, quote, with a Masonic number, striking his sword five, one, two, three, four, five, three, one, two, three, one, and the two times. It's interesting that if you had five and three, one, you get nine. And then two times, that's 11. We got 911. The Masonic number is 911. You ever find it interesting why the emergency number on the telephone is 911? The Masonic number, five. Then three, that's eight. Then one is nine. And then two wraps, one and one. It's 911. We're all under Masonic rule, controlled by the Jesuit general. And I think it's time we started talking about it. I think it's time that we started doing something about it. Go a little bit farther. My final quote for the day. Page 335. They, the Jesuits, came out of the very mouth, the very heart, and the very bowels of the Pope and of the devil. They, the Jesuits, will have the religion of Muhammad established to poison and plague all the east parts of the world in their souls. Now also in the, in the apostate post-Reformation West, I add. And they will have the most huge, cruel, and savage armies of the Turks raised up. And I add, an Arab, Turkish, Muslim world, united by the Pope's present Anglo-American-led crusade, and for which reason the Pope disapproves of Turkey joining his European Union. Yes. And savage armies of the Turks raised up to murder and massacre millions of men in their bodies in the west part of the world. And I add, the coming Sino-Soviet Muslim invasion of apostate Protestant North America. Who said this? His name was Arthur Dent. He was a Presbyterian preacher. He wrote a book titled The Ruin of Rome or An Exposition Upon the Whole Revelation. And you know when he wrote this? About savage armies of the Turks raised up to murder and massacre millions of men and their bodies in the west part of the world. Do you know when he wrote that? 1798. 1798. Go to my book, Vatican Assassins, page 335, chapter 13. The bottom of the page, there it is. I'm telling you, white men, our days are numbered. But I've done my duty, and I've warned you, and I will not be ashamed because I've declared the whole counsel of God to my generation, and specifically my generation of white men in North America, as well as in Western Europe and wherever else we might live. And if you continue not to do anything about this picture, you're going to lose everything. And you will lose it to the designs of the devil as he uses his Jesuit order and his counter-reformation quest to destroy the last vestige of the Protestant Reformation and hence Western civilization. And you have the opportunity right now to do something about it.
you can do two things. First, three things, actually. The first thing you need to do is truly repent of your sin and believe the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. That he died for your sins according to the scripture and was buried and rose again. And upon truly repenting, as God has commanded all of us to repent, all men everywhere to repent and believing this gospel, he'll save you by his grace and make you a son of God, see you the day of redemption, Ephesians 4.30. And now you have the power to do something against this conspiracy, this mystery of iniquity. Two things I need for you to do. First of all, I need you to pray for me 60 seconds a day. I need your prayers first and foremost. After I have your prayers, then I need you to give financially. Just had a dear brother give 640 bucks just uh, Friday. Praise God. I mean, I appreciate anything that's given, but we're going to have to sacrifice, gentlemen, or we're not going to have anything. And remember that the founding fathers, nearly all of them died broke. What's your freedom worth to you? What's it worth to you to bequeath to your dear children political liberty? For me, it's worth everything. Brother Eric John Phelps, men, brethren, what shall we do? Go to my website, 24-7 World Radio dot com forward slash app and tune in without a download please support the ministry go to the website and you can give purchase the things that i have for sale last of all pray for me until wednesday maranatha This is 24-7 World Radio. Don't think your story needs in